We close tonight with something showing up in cities across the country. It is a $5,500 bike car hybrid called the Elf. Vicente Arenas took a test drive. They run on sunshine and sweat, and they're hard to miss in Durham, North Carolina. Commuter Lori Bush loves turning heads. Oh, I got a lot of funny looks. Sometimes I'll see people with the kids in the back and they're waving. This egg-shaped machine is called an ELF, short for electric, light, and fun. It's a great mix of a car and a bike. It's actually a backwards tricycle fueled by bike pedals and a tiny solar-powered motor that can carry passengers and cargo up to 550 pounds. This is a huge game changer. It's the brainchild of inventor and former race car technician Rob Cotter, CEO of Organic Transit. What we're looking to do is take the bicycle experience and integrate it with car-like functions. Pure pedal power right now? Yeah. The ELF requires no insurance or gasoline and is pollution free. It does 20 miles per hour with straight pedal power. Add the motor and the ELF can do 35. Just stop pedaling and I'm just all this is all power. And it goes on its own. It's yeah. estimated that the average ELF driver yes. could eliminate three tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere every year. This is a 100 watt flexible solar panel. In 18 months, Cotter has built and sold 450 ELFs and plans to triple that this year. Most of the planet, they don't have automobiles. They don't have cars. Some of them hardly have roads. He's poised to scale up to mass production with sales at resorts, at senior centers, and in developing countries. I don't even own a Duke parking pass anymore. I just have a Duke bike permit. Charlotte Clark is a staffer at Duke University where up to a dozen elves park each day. I have only put about uh, 5,000 miles on my car since I've had the elf. Way less than half of what I used to. It may not be ready for the interstate, but the elf is making inroads in local neighborhoods where people like Charlotte Clark hit the road every day. Vicente Arena, CBS News, Durham, North Carolina. Hi. I'd like to talk about the different types of energy, and I break it down into two categories. One would be passive, and one would be energetic. And mostly, uh, passive is, is a fossil fuel. And it kind of leads to a passive culture in that it makes life a little softer, a little easier, um, sedentary lifestyle, um, most of it's coal and oil. And um, we don't really think, we don't have to see it coming, being extracted. We don't think how it affects our communities. We don't uh, think how it's affecting our lives directly. But um, a lot of this comes back to the automobile. Uh, about 70% of our trips are two miles or less. There's about a billion cars on the road, and it's the most polluting thing that each of us do each and every day. And so that sedentary lifestyle leads to all sorts of ramifications like cancer, cardiovascular disease, lung disease, which accumulated in the U.S. comes to about a trillion dollars a year. Um, so if we look at energetic types of uh, energy, which solar, which is prolific, uh, readily available, inexpensive, and we look at wind power, um, which is mechanical, very clean. Um, in places like China, actually, they have more wind capacity than we have in the United States for all our nuclear power plants combined. So this is the ELF we decided to uh, use the most uh, abundant natural resources, which is sunlight and calories. Um, so this is, your, this is your body in an energetic culture, and this is your body in a passive culture. Um, so, um, but where, are these, where does these devices, energy devices, come from? And where are they going? Where does it all happen? Well, you know, the most prolific energy device is our mind. And um, this is all created by us and for us. But if we're going to change the world for a better place, we're going to have to change our behavior. And so um, part of it is what we call environmental prosperity. Environmental prosperity are products that improve the, the health of the user, the uh, livability of the community, and makes the planet cleaner. So we're going to take a look at some of the um, 
different types of people that have created some of the different uh, types of energy devices. And this one would be on the passive side. This is Thomas Midgley. So Thomas Midgley has the distinct reputation of being known as the, the worst organism in human history. Um, he was the guy that figured out how to put more lead in our lives. And even though it had a history for 100 years prior of being extremely toxic, he was able to get into gasoline, which they weren't able to get out until the 90s. Um, and uh, you know, it's had amazing detrimental effects. And then also, he was the creator of Freon, which helps destroy the ozone. So he's an amazing guy. Um, but uh, um, I'd like to cover some people now that have worked with on the energetic side of energy. And um, uh, this is Dr. Paul McCready. I had the good fortune of working with him uh, for a short time a number of years ago. And he was noted as the engineer of the century. Uh, he's known for having built the Gossamer Condor and the Gossamer Albatross, the pedal-powered aircraft, um, which eventually went across the English Channel. And it was really very much a significant uh, game changer in that you can, one person could fly an aircraft with their own energy, which led to multiple things. But he also was the creator and the catalyst uh, of the EV-1, the General Motors vehicle that was famous in, uh, you know, what happened to the electric car and these other movies. Uh, which was enormously efficient, but uh, was recalled by General Motors and crushed. And then he's also known as the grandfather of the drone, which either way you look at it, they're enormously efficient uh, unmanned vehicles that he was producing 40 years ago. And then this is Stanford Oshinsky. Stanford has about 400 patents, um, about close to 100 of them regarding solar devices, but he also did LEDs and CDs and DVDs, things like that. But he's really unique in that, like, this is one of his flexible solar panel factories. He would patent the device, create it, and then build the factories that actually produced it. Um, he did large-scale uh, utility uh, load uh, leveling batteries, and he also did the first batteries for laptops or cell phones um, and the, the original GM EV1 batteries. So the ELF gets the equivalent of 1,800 miles per gallon, is solar-powered. So we're really on the cusp of actually creating vehicles that create more energy than they consume. Vehicles that actually create more energy than they consume. This is kind of a different way of looking at things. So how does that happen? So this is I call efficiency 101, that vehicle on the top left there, that's actually a bicycle. It's one guy, two wheels, pedaling like crazy. And he has the record of 83.3 miles per hour. So if you stuck your head outside the window of your car at 80 miles an hour, you realize the aerodynamic forces that he's force, uh, going up against. Uh, the next vehicle was actually built by a colleague of mine, Michael Lewis, and that's the world's most efficient electric vehicle. That gets about the equivalent of 6,200 miles per gallon on two regular car lead-acid batteries. He can go about 60 miles in one hour, and uh, um, it was about 110 miles per hour total speed. And then the bottom vehicle is the world record for miles per gallon. That's 13,000 miles per gallon. So you have to wonder, like, why can't we have 1% of that? Uh, so part of what we're doing to introduce the ELF, we're working on a technology called ElfShare. And so that would be a network of, of people, uh, 25 to 30 users per week per ELF. And so you'd have your app. Other people in your network would know you're going home that evening with the ELF, and you're coming in 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. So then you might get a message from Mad Hatter Cafe saying, because they know the route you're coming in on, stop by the farmer's market, pick up the 40 pounds of organic tomatoes, and if you could drop them by for us. So a couple of things interesting happened there. One is the commuter's trip is now subsidized. It didn't cost them anything to do this. Number two is the Mad Hatter didn't have to hire a driver, get a truck, or you know, parking spaces, creating pollution. So we had two trips happening at one time with a zero carbon vehicle. So when you get to work, you leave it on the sidewalk, and the next person knows, oh, it's my turn now to go get it. So this is enormously beneficial for first and last mile issues, for public transportation, if people want to get to and from the train station or the bus stop. Um, it's also really good for the high demand for parking in cities. So if an ELF was used to this extent, it would prevent about six tons of CO2 from entering the atmosphere each year. That's like planting 900 trees every year just from using a vehicle. 
Another aspect we're working on is the autonomous elf. So probably most of you are familiar with the Google driverless car, and that's a couple of tons of steel rolling down the highway at 70 miles an hour. Well, picture a um, 160-pound vehicle going 15 or 20 miles an hour, riding around a campus or a small village, dropping off packages, or perhaps meeting you at the dentist's office as you're coming out, so now it's time to go traveling on. This is the ox. This is a elf-like technology. We're working on it right now. It's under 200 pounds and can carry 800 pound payload. Uh, this will come in a couple of different configurations. Um, a pickup truck, obviously, a cube van, kind of a food type truck. But where this really starts to make sense is in developing nations where it might take all day to go get five or 10 gallons of fresh water. With an elf type vehicle, you can go get a 55 gallon drum of water when you return to the village the pedal and the solar can be utilized for, as a micro utility station to charge up cell phones, radios, water purifiers, things like that. So this is the pedicab version of the ox. This would be like a taxi cab, and this can carry three passengers. So it's predicted that there'll be about 70% of the world population will be living in cities in 30 years. We need vehicles that are lighter, smaller, cleaner, shared by more people, and they can carry more passengers at kind of safe human scale speeds. This is, we call this the four by. This is kind of in the category of a oversized four passenger scooter. Uh, it'll have like four horsepower, but could still carry four people up and down hills. And uh, um, it's just kind of a great efficient way to get around town. And uh, part of the equity in transportation is for the disabled that are often left out of the equation. Um, oftentimes they're in those little rascal type of scooters out in the rain or they have to wait for the fifth bus to come to go where they need to go. So this allows them the freedom to go not to the closest store but to the store they want to go to on the other side of town in any kind of weather. This we call the E3 and this is legally a motorcycle. It's actually a fully enclosed three-person electric motorcycle, solar, and it goes about 100 miles an hour and will go about 250 mile range at very high efficiency. And this is part of the spectrum that we like to think of as filling the space between a bicycle and a car. So this would be a great advantage for people that don't need a car or like to get away from a car. And I'd like to close with a, a quote from Dr. Seuss, and that is, think left, think right, think low, think high, think of the things you'll think if you try. Thank you very much.